All right. So I saw uh, Loris send out this tweet. Looks really exciting. Yes, Go does have exceptions. I did not know Go has exceptions. Can you believe that? Can you believe that Go has exceptions? I, did, I, I, I didn't even know these things. All right. The Zig official website states in its overview page the following em emphasis mine. So examples of hidden control flow. Okay. So var A equals B plus C dot D foo bar. Examples of hidden control flow. Uh, D has property functions, which are methods that you can call uh, with what looks like fields access. So in the above example, C dot D might call a function. Ooh, I, I, I've always disliked that. I have never, again, proxy properties, never, just, I just, I just, I know people are like, oh, setters are awesome. I don't know. Are they awesome? Are setters awesome? Are setters awesome? I don't think so. Uh, C++, D, and Rust have operator overloading, so the plus operator might call a function. C++, D, and Go have throw slash catch exceptions, such as foo might throw an exception and prevent bar from being called. So I did not know that Go has exceptions. I'm a little bit confused by this. I assume he must be talking about macro or macros uh, uh, panics right is it panics there must be panic and recover okay go does have throw exception that's what panic and recover is is that yes it's not the default method of handling errors but it does get used as one and not just by a random java smelling package nobody uses it's used in every go routine right i've never used recover i don't even, i actually don't even know how to use recover if i started to write recover I would wash my eyeballs out immediately. I assume it's not quite the same either. Yeah. All right. The Go standard library uses panic recover as control flow mechanisms in parser code, for example. At Go Lab 2022, I asked Go, let's see, I asked a Go core team member if it would make sense to have never recover policy in one code space to avoid a bunch of concurrent related foot guns, e.g. mutexes that fail to unlock because the defer unlock didn't run during a panic. Ooh, I did not know that. A panic can poison a lock. Or forever lock a lock, not poison a lock. Sorry, no, no poison in the lock, just forever lock a lock. Yikes! And their answer was that you must assume that code that you depend on might try to recover, including standard lib code. Link to the question, but I recommend watching the whole talk if you're a Go developer. Ooh, why would you ever want to panic other than crash the program? I, I just assumed a panic was purely like it's it. Panic was effectively log on the error, the standard error, OS exit one. Uh, the author striked the article just now. Refresh the article. What? Did, oh, what? Oh, strike the article. Oh, nice. Okay, on. Oh, let's do live, live updating of an article as we read. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Panic should be I can't continue. Panic shouldn't just be I can't continue at some reduced scope. It should be I can't continue at like the global scope. I'm very confused why anyone would use it any differently. But I maybe older code that before panic would really had because you know sometimes like as a language gets started like ideas float around about how you should do things and then as the language slowly gets like more and more adopted canonical patterns come out and then you realize well wait a second wait a moment this isn't good therefore you know it goes through and make sure it does it the correct way so i could see that panic might uh, exist in older code in which that was considered like the, probably the right way uh panic uh Let's see, isn't panic approach considered not idiomatic approach and go? Yes, but it may, I think at one point it was considered fine, but now it's not considered fine. Anyways, okay, so the mutexes, uh, so defers do, do defers actually get executed? Uh, panics are used in web servers like Echo, really. Does stack on wanting to finish all the defers? Very interesting. Oh, it does to finish the defers. Okay, well, that's good. Hey, panics uh, finish the defers, that's good. That's good to know. Uh, note that this is a problem that might affect you even if you never call recover yourself, as any code that you depend on might uh, might do so on your behalf, e.g. the ab above callback de uh, defined by you. Ooh, yeah, like in an echo server. Okay, so in an echo server, if you hit it with a panic, an echo server with a panic would cause this problem, correct? It would, it, or sorry, an echo server with a panic would cause a 500, I assume? That must be what what what's going on. Is that is that what the these echo servers actually do, or whatever these servers are? Is that they go, hey, let's let's avoid you, in fact, crashing your server. Again, very strange to me. That all that stuff is very very strange. I don't get it. Panic inside of a defer. <laughs> That's crazy. It's crazy. We keep getting new issues opened on Zig, uh, the official Zig website repository from people that tried to correct us. So I'll start linking this post whenever I close them. But a more high-level point, the fact that Go users don't realize that their language does have exceptions, in my opinion, a shortcoming of Go marketing and learning industry. I mean, that's fair. But we also, you know, like, Go largely tries to tell you not to use them. But you are right. If a Go, if a Go, a Go core team member says it makes sense to have, let's see, that you can't have a never recover policy. 
That's interesting. It's it's just a weird world. This is a weird world to be in. Like I'm I'm very curious why why you can't have this set. Like recovery is impossible if a panic happens. Every all defers get executed. Everything gets unwound, and then your program closes. Like to me, that seems like a that seems like a pretty reasonable behavioral ask. Let's see. I believe the Zig philosophy starts from the "it's better to crash than to get the wrong results" kind of thing, and I I fully actually agree with that. If t- in my head at least, a panic represents that the state of the like an invariant in the program has been tripped, and therefore the program itself can no longer continue to run. At least that's how I treat panics. And so I'd be very surprised. I guess I'm very surprised that it'd be treated any other way because it seems like if if something that can be recovered from the proper handling would be an error, right? Like we already have a we already have a channel for that. Oh, you want to recover at a certain level? Here's an error channel. I keep looking at this question, trying to think of the best way to answer it. It's easiest to just point out uh, point to the idiomatic uses for panic recover as opposed to the try catch something that looks like an incorrectly stated bash error piping. Standard air piping problem, uh, and I assume this is and or uh, exceptions in the languages or in other languages or the concepts behind those idioms, which can be basically summed up as exceptions should only occur in truly exceptional circumstances. But as to what the actual difference is between them, I'll try to summarize the best I can. One of the main differences compared to try catch blocks is the way control flow in. Let's see. In a typical try catch scenario, the code after the catch block will run unless it propagates the error. This is not so with the panic recover. A panic aborts the current function and begins to unwind the stack, running defer functions, deferred functions. The only place recover does anything as it encounters them. I really, let's see, really, I'd take that even further. Panic recover is almost nothing like try catch in the sense that try and catch are, or at least act like control structures. Panic and recover are not. This really stems out of the fact that recover is built around the defer mechanism, which, as far as I can tell, is a fairly unique concept in Go. This is obviously a little old, yeah, 2016. (laughs) They didn't know about Zig, did they? Um, There are certainly more, which I'll add, if if I can uh, actuate my thoughts a bit better. This is literally the same as try and catch. I think what he's saying is this. It's not the same in try and catch for this reason. Let's pretend that we had just like, we had some code. It doesn't matter what the code is. Then we have a panic behind some sort of if statement, right? And then we had more code. When you hit that panic, you're gone, right? I don't know. I've, again, I don't know how. Uh, I don't, I've never even tried the use recover. I, I assume what is being said is that try catch that you can put this anywhere. And the code that's right here and the code that's right here, the code down here can continue to execute. I think that's what he's saying is that this all this code this way cannot execute. This code has no ability to execute, whereas try catches in like a little block scope. I guess I'd have to look at recover here. I've never looked at recover. How do you recover in Golang? Defer funk recover. Oh, interesting. What the hell is recover? Where's the panic? Where did the panic happen? Uh, if the function G takes an int and panics, if it's greater than three. Oh, okay. So function G, where's G? If it's greater, we do it. We hit it with the panic, right? And so recover F. Okay, so there you go. Okay, so that's what's happening. So this gets called, yeah, recover is built in. So recover is just a function somewhere along the way. So this, yeah, I mean, I, I guess you could argue that this isn't like try catch in how it does it, but it spiritually is like try catch. Why it's not like try catch is that it, it's, it's more like catch. Like in try catch, you have a try and a catch, right? You actually have it in this order. And then maybe a finally if you're crazy, right? <sighs> It doesn't even work in JavaScript. It used to, like, there used to be actually some pretty big bugs, at least in the JavaScript core on how finalies are, uh, that's it. Whereas this thing's only catch, right? You can specify somewhere a recover. And so it's not that you can define where the scope of this is. You can only de- define, I assume you can only define it at a specific scope that's through defers. I'd have to play around with this more. I, I, don't, I don't really understand. It's like just a, it's just a catch. And that feels that feels bizarre. Oh my gosh! Hey Lex, what's the simplest program you would recommend to write uh, to get good feel for Go or Rust? Um, I think f- those are two different ones. For Rust, I would recommend a. I think something with strings and iterators is really fun. So any of the advent of code ones are really great to to have a good time with. Uh, CLI applications, writing Cat, right? Uh, those are really great. Rust is really really fantastic at parsers. 
So playing out with parsers and not even suggesting solving AOC with Lex on stream. I mean, Lex, if you'd like to solve advent of code problems with me using Rust on stream, invite open, of course, naturally. Uh, Go, on the other hand, I think Go, what makes Go more fun is sure, you can do all those things in Go. Not a problem. I just don't think Go is that much fun for that kind of problems. I think it's just, it's like Go, you can use for string handling, but it's just really annoying at string handling, right? It's just not as fun as Rust. Rust is really great. So if you're going to do, if you're going to do Go, I'd recommend like servers or processes or tools. Like say you want, like you want to build a tool that can spawn processes and then write off to those right off to those processes. I think Go is just really good. Go is just so easy to do that type of handling. For Go, we build simple CRUD backend or similar. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You build like an app with Go. With Rust, I feel like you want to build CLIs, string processing, that kind of stuff, right? Go string parsing is also next level. Ah, it's not next level. Go string processing is not next level. If you use Go string processing, you know for a fact that it's not next level. It's very not next. <laughs> it's very not next level. It's it, you just have to call. It's you have to write it in an extremely procedural way. Whereas when you do uh, something with with like Rust, you get to write it in this very kind of functionally iterative way that's like super super fun and a lot of fun. You know, it's just like it's good. It's it's a good time, and then you can write your own little iterators to to go on top of it and. You can do all that stuff. Uh, if by next level you mean next JS level, then yes, Go is next JS level string parsing. Dang, dang, TJ. TJ is just TJ is just really trying to squeeze it all out. Anyways, that's at least what I like Rust. For me, I always enjoyed Rust. Whenever it came to you have I Rust for me, Rust programs are always the best when you have something like an X input into a box, and it produces some sort of you know X prime. Like this, this style program, so CLIs are a great example of this, are just so much fun to run. They're just so good because you, you just do a series of transforms on this. Bada bing, bada boom, right? Yeah, Prime mentioned that, by the way, that's X Prime for those that are wondering. I feel like that just makes life really, really nice. It's true. And it's just, it's really good at those things. There you go. Uh, got it. Uh, CLI with Rust, app with Go. This will be fun. Yeah, yeah. Go get it. By the way, Advent of Code is a really great one for Rust. And I'd also recommend read the Rust book on ownership. That's really important. The Rust book on ownership will just it will just clear up. Just just read that. Just it takes like thirty minutes. Read through it how it all works, and you will just not be super confused. At least get to that point. If you don't read how ownership works. You're just going to be really frustrated. Okay, let's let's go back to this thing because I am actually curious about this. I understand that exceptions are out of fashion, uh, but if your language does have exceptions and if blessed, e.g. St- standard lib code uses them, then users shouldn't be convinced that your language doesn't have exceptions. Yeah, this might be like a, this might be like a, a touch, like well actually kind of style on the language. I think just generally speaking, panic and recover is not something people rely on. And so it's like, canonically, you do not rely on that. And it's not something that you should ever rely on. Everywhere that there's a panic, it should just, it it should be thought of that way. Uh, Obviously, recover is clearly a catch. Now, there's no try. It's just a catch. And so that is, that's kind of interesting. Um, People, a lot of people don't even know that there's labels and go-tos either. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things. Just because your language supports go-tos doesn't mean that you have to use a go-to. So it's kind of, I, I understand what you're saying, though, is that there is this mechanism which can cause unique behavior. Like, I didn't realize, I should have known this because I feel like I get, I did kind of know this, that something like Echo would use recovery, which I'm a little bit confused by that, or recover. Uh, I always thought Echo or any of these servers didn't use that. They instead used something that looked like, uh, I just assumed that the code looked like this. It could be like a go funk, and then it would call like your your handler, right? And get like, the value or whatever the interface is out of here and then do some uh, handling. And then these values right here are actually specified up here. And then it probably, I just always assumed it used a weight group and then do like a defer weight on here, right? Some sort of defer weight. And then if this thing goes through and you have a value that it all works out else, 
it just explodes, right? Like it just goes, oh, panic doesn't work. I think panic is more performant. Oh, is that why? Yeah, I would assume panic is more performant because I assume a weight has at minimally at atomics, whereas I assume panic, but it must also have atomics. I'm not really sure how it all works. Like, right? I never looked at that. But what if the handler panics? Then your whole program should crash. Or, well, actually, technically, uh, in Go, your thread cra or your Go funk crashes. And so when your Go funk crashes, these values aren't assigned, which means if your these values are not assigned, then you could properly respond out with a 500. Yay. That's, that's actually just how I thought it all worked. I have no idea that it didn't work that way. Moving on. Um, okay, there's a quick little correction right there. Uh, let's see, correction. Uh, I don't know what WRT stands for. I'm too afraid to ask what it means. The strikeout part. I misremembered this talk section slightly. Defers do run during a panic, but other stuff could be left in a corrupted state. Yes, this is what I worry about is that, like that, that. For me, a panic seems like it could, it could, it could be even worse. I'm not, Chad, I'm not even looking at you. Uh, the speaker does mention the possibility of mutex corruption in the Q&A section and how Rust does better, but they don't go into further detail. Rock on. The name. Don't use panics unless if you mean to crash your program, okay? That's, I mean, this is why I fully, I have fully, I have fully, completely leaned into it, and I just OSX at one. I just make it happen. You know what the best part is? Is that, like, my little program that I made, I even made flushables. So, like, you can register with the program things that you really want to be flushed. So, in my simulation, I can take down the server, and the server can be guaranteed died at the end. And so, it's like, no matter what, this thing's going down. At the end of everything, we shut this bad boy down. It's the end. That's it, right? I love, I you know, I just, it just makes me happy personally. Okay, that's just me. So we just OS exit that SOB and call it a day. There we go. A gen. 